I'm Tom Swetterlich, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Tom Swetterlich. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I really appreciate you listening. If you go to hankgarner.com, you can go through all of the archives, more than 300 shows, author interviews with the very best people in publishing today. On the right-hand sidebar, there's places where you can subscribe uh, for just about every platform that you could possibly listen to the show on. I'd like to thank some sponsors today for their faithful support and for enabling us to bring you quality content like we do. Uh, Krista Watanabe from Pico's House is uh, one of the best editors I've ever met and uh, whose work I really admire. She offers developmental editing, line editing, and beta reading. Uh, She's currently booking for May, so go ahead and send her uh, a message now to uh, get your project scheduled with her. She has four proofreaders on staff, so she can accommodate authors with uh, much shorter lead time than some other editors do. Uh, She's a new affiliate member of the SFWA and she comes recommended by best-selling authors such as Hugh Howey and Samuel Peralta. Uh, most of her experiences with science fiction, speculative fiction, and middle-grade fantasy, uh, but she really enjoys editing all genres and can really make your project shine. If you will mention author stories when booking uh, your editing services, you can receive a $75 discount on manuscripts over 60,000 in length or $25 discount on short stories. Pico's House, P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E. Please tell Crystal that you heard about it on Author Stories. Also, the Debt Collector series by Chuck Buddha. Debt is a death sentence. Michael Wright lives the American dream. He works hard every day but still lives paycheck to paycheck. The bills keep piling up and now his 10-year-old daughter requires surgery to save her life. Michael is in a race against time to find money, but how far is he willing to go? Is he prepared to do whatever it takes? Can he defeat a menacing evil that stands in his way? The Debt Collector series is a gripping tale of psychological horror, raising questions about our modern lifestyles and the terrifying possibilities that hit too close to home. One reader described it as if serial killers and Wall Street made friends. Pay up and die, delinquent, bankrupt. The Debt Collector series is available in paperback and ebook formats exclusively from Amazon or free through Amazon Kindle Unlimited. Walk Beside Me by Christine Handy. Willow Adair has a picture perfect life, or so it seems. A stunning model turned wife and mother, she lives in a beautiful home with her husband and two kids in historic Bexley, one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Columbus, Ohio. On the outside, she has everything. On the inside, she struggles with issues of self worth, spurned by her neglectful husband and hated. By her rebellious teen daughter, Willow never feels she is good enough. She fears everyone she loves will leave. Walk Beside Me is the story of a woman who peels away the layers to find her inner warrior, a woman who faces insurmountable odds and thanks to her earthly angels, learns to treasure the gift of God's infinite light and love. Walk Beside Me by Christine Handy Thank you to all of our sponsors for making the show possible. If you would like to sponsor the show, please go to HankGarner.com. And there's a link in the top menu bar where you can do that. At the end of the show, if you'll stick around, we're going to have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Authors Cat. We're bringing the story behind the stores and the tellers. Today, I'm excited to have Tom Sweaterlich on the show. He has a brand new book out called The Gone World that is absolutely amazing. I am so excited to talk with Tom today, and I think all of you are going to want to rush out and buy this book uh, as soon as it hits shelves. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you for having me. I love your show, by the way. I, I, I've been listening to a lot of the uh, archived episodes, and they're they're fantastic. Oh, so, thank so you thank so you much. for having me on. This is cool. Uh, Oh, thank you. That's uh, that's amazing. Um, well, the, if you've listened to several, then you know that we can't do anything until we answer the first question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Yes, that is the first question. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, about that, um, you know, I definitely have 
specific memories of being maybe about seven years old and writing uh, short stories based on G.I. Joe because I remember trying to figure out how to spell phonetically the sound of a rocket launcher. Um, so there were sort of like G.I. Joe, Red Dawn mashups that I was writing. Um, and then and then I recently came across a notebook from when I was 11. I could date it. It was called Red Ribbons of Death Part 6. And it was part of a novel I was writing. I don't have parts one through five. So I know I've just always kind of been been writing um, for as long as I can remember. That's awesome. Um, so a- as a kid, um, what types of things really caught your imagination other than G.I. Joe? And, um, uh, you know, w- were those the things that just really got you into reading? Yeah, G.I. Joe, Transformers. Um, well, you know. That, that's what I was watching. I actually was a, a fairly late reader. I mean, I could read. I, I learned to read. But I mean, just in terms of actually picking up books on my own, I didn't really start reading until I was about a sophomore in high school. Um, so I, I missed a lot of the, you know, sort of classic young adult books that a lot of people uh, have as touchstones uh, for their lives. And so uh, once I started to read, though, I was just voracious, uh, couldn't couldn't pass a book up, uh, so to speak. But yeah, it came a little bit later in my life. Well, I think that's that's true for a lot of people. You know, you have to there, and a lot of times there's a a particular book or something that uh, that you connect with that just really opens you know a whole new dimension uh, to you as a reader. Do, do you remember what it was uh, in your in, in your high school time there when, when kind of the blinders were taken off and and you know it became a, a thing to you? Yeah, definitely. There were two. One, just encountering Edgar Allan Poe in American Lit class. That was sophomore. And the other is kind of strange. I don't even know where I found it. It just, it just must have been around. But there's a novel called The Last Temptation of Christ by a Greek writer. And for some reason, I picked that up when I was – It was I was also a sophomore in high school. And those – I remember just – wrestling with that novel and just reading it, carrying it around with me, do- dog-earing pages. I, I'm not, I'm not, I, I wish I remembered why, why I picked that up in the first place. But yeah, Edgar Allan Poe and, and The Last Temptation of Christ, for some reason, those were the two that uh, just opened up my mind and I, and I went from there. That, that's really uh, interesting that you say that because reading your latest book, um, I can see those influences. I definitely the Poe influence, um, and and really probably the the mind bending, uh, mind opening aspects of reading something like The Last Temptation. Probably uh, you, you can see those traces as well. Um, do, do you remember what it was about uh, The Last Temptation that just really uh, kept you reading? Well, it, it, it's very beautifully written. And it's very challenging. Um, I, I really like being challenged with books, and um, it, it confronts you with uh, very, very heavy ideas that make you uncomfortable. And uh, that's actually something I, I seek out uh, quite often. And uh, so I think, I think you know, sort of it does within blocks for you know how I still look for books to read and and and, and what I really fall in love with. I think. Um, yeah, I think so. I've actually never seen the movie, the Source, which is very controversial. I haven't seen that. I, I should, I should take a look. <laughs> should, for, for as important as the book is in my life, I, I've never seen the movie. I haven't tracked that down. <laughs> um, as a writer, um, because you said that is so important to you, do you seek out to uh, to kind of mess with people's preconceived notions or to write things uh, that make them uh, maybe uncomfortable with the status quo? Well, that's that's an interesting question. I I, I want to say I want to say no only because I I don't think I assume about someone who would pick up a book what what they would be comfortable with. But by the same token, uh, for for both I this is my second novel for both of my books. Um, if I if I start going down a certain avenue or taking up a certain idea, I definitely don't ever want to pu- like pull punches or or take the easy way out. So. Um, I think I'm challenging myself more, more so than an imagined reader. But if, if a reader is challenged, then I, I'm, I don't shy away from that. Certainly. Yeah. Um, what was it about Edgar Allan Poe, uh, that, that captured your imagination? Was it just the, um, you know, the, the very uncomfortable nature <laughs> There seems to be a theme here, uh, of a lot of his stories. Uh, you know, I, I remember as a, as a young teenager, uh, discovering poet and probably in English class, maybe telltale heart was yep. kind of one of those first things they introduce you to. And, uh, and I 
I remember thinking, man, this guy is so twisted, yet it's so <laughs> beautifully written. Like, I, I, I don't want to read it, and I have to read it all at the same time. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I'll be honest. I'm probably, like, I was, I was with you, I was probably 15 or 16, it was an English class, and uh, probably it was just sort of the more, uh, you know, the emo parts of... <laughs> <laughs> that we're you know i was picking up on i i um but but those aspects that you mentioned are certainly there um and the other thing you know the other thing he does is uh, in his poetry it's so musical and um almost easy to make fun of how musical it is but if you're you know when, when you're starting to like come across literature for the first time um really hearing and understanding the music of language comes through just loud and clear with edgar Allan poe and it's it can just serve as sort of a, a portal way into um, learning how to study other types of, of writing and, 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 you know, just sort of, uh, you know, observing the intrinsic artistic qualities and writing in general. I think he's a he's an excellent first step for that. And, and last step. I mean, he's he's uh, we shouldn't just put him in high school. But um, but, yeah, that's certainly where a lot of people encounter him. For sure. Um, so what did you decide that you wanted to do with your life? Uh, you know, in, in high school and in college, we start thinking about career paths and things like that. What did you think that you wanted to do? Yeah. What do I still think I would want to do? <laughs> this may be the question. Um, you know, I, I didn't. I was uh, I was OK in the student, especially in high school. And um, but I, I was always just once once that hit of literature happened, I was just always totally passionate about literature writing. Um, so coming out of it. I really didn't apply to college at all. I just wasn't going to. I just wanted to write. I didn't have any, any clues to where I was going was doing. And it seems like most of kind of factored with learning along. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I just love writing. That's, that's it. That's what I, that's what I love. So any, any kind of career I've had has always just been to, you know, on the, on the sidelines of my true passion, if that makes sense. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people come to writing later in life and, um, uh, you know, after, kind of collecting uh, different stories of their own, you know, by working different jobs and, and things like that. And then, you know, we kind of report on that. But I, I love the idea of someone being so passionate about it that that they have arranged their life uh, to be able to support that. Um, I, I love that. Uh, tell me about the first book that you wrote. Uh, Tomorrow and Tomorrow was the first book that you published. Was that the first one, uh, the first full book that you wrote? No, uh, <laughs> I had <laughs> well, as most people, you know, have some, you know, sitting in a desk drawer and that's right. I, I shouldn't admit to this, but I do tell people all the time because I, I like that I did it. It's very terrible. I I had spent so right after college, um, most of the writing I was doing was poetry. And so I came in a little bit later. I was mid to late 20s. Um, there was a there was a time of seven years where I would work every day on a zombie novel and 500 rhymed sons. And I did. I finished that book. It is so terrible that my my wife almost you know refuses to, allow me to mention it, mention its name, but um, but it taught me a lot about your projects. It taught me a, a lot about character plot. So I, I consider that this experiment as my training ground for built a novel. Um, so it was it was totally worth doing. Uh, but yeah, this was a huge chunk of my life. Uh, so that thing that shall never be shall never see the light of day. The thing that shall be was well, terrible. Or just meant to genius. <laughs> It's a fun sometimes. Well, it depends on your are we <laughs> It's just us. No, uh, yeah. it was, it's, it's bad. I, I don't think, like, oh, I could go back and, and rewrite this. No, no, I have the, no, but it's, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's no good. <laughs> that's, that's one of the best things I've heard ever. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. First, we're going to say, you know, don't tell anybody about writing like Twilight Finchin or something. But, you know, <laughs> zombie sauna still a little there. <laughs> so so how, how did you come on the idea of tomorrow and tomorrow, that if not all that you, that you wrote and published? First of so, all, let, let me back just a second. You said game science fiction later. What brought you science fiction? Oh yeah. Um, well, you know, there's a number. There's a number of people who are sort of you know so, like you know, talk about a lot. So you know, Poe obviously has been foot in in that genre, and so I was kind of opposed to him. Through, through high school. I, I was big on horror fiction. I was huge in at high school. It's not like it was a foreign concept to me, but um, college started really studying uh, poetry, and I think through that avenue it, it led me to what I called classes like uh, I learned about James Joyce, and eventually when I was in the the school library and just through books found a novel by Max Ernst. So it's sort of like this, a real novel told in pictures. And even though it's a real one, it was something close to science fiction. And I, I really wanted that. At college, I um, started working at this book called Library for London. And my job there was essentially as a, I'd recommend books to people. And so many people would ask about, you know, mystery novels and science fiction novels that all of their passion kind of just filled me too. And I uh, thought 
the Shrek movie, one of my favorite all-time movies, Total Recall. So, of course, that led me to Philip K. Dick. When I found Philip K. Dick, it was like a light went going off of here is someone that's blending every influence, everything I've been passionate about into a story. And so Philip K. Dick was my entry point. And this was this was before sort of Philip K. Dick exploded in popularity. I can't say that. I, I, had to, I had to really work to track down his short stories when I was getting rid, uh, getting into him for the first time. But Philip K. Dick led me to like John Brunner, J.G. Ballard, especially. Um, and so I, I sort of found found the, the kinds of writers that I thought my voice matched. And uh, yeah, I've, I've I've been writing science fiction ever since. You know, a lot of people, you know, have an easy interest in science fiction by uh, more pop culture, mainstream, maybe Star Trek, Star Wars, uh, and then graduate to deeper stuff. You went straight to the deep with Philip Dick. I was a little bit older. I mean, I was probably in my, I was like maybe 24 when I first read him. But, you know, it's funny because a lot of people, I mean, I watched it obviously when I was a kid, but, you know, the, the movie the movie as a kid that resonated me with me was uh, Who Framed a Rabbit? And I remember seeing that in the theater about six times. And sometimes I think back on that movie and there's... You know, when I think of it, like mind bendable hijinks noir movie, and I think, oh, yeah, I can do that back then. Um, yeah, where like Star Wars for some reason just, you know, I really like, it kind of bounced off me in a way that, um, yeah, I didn't have that entry early in life like a lot of people seem to have. Yeah. Take the new came uh, Prime Electric Dreams. I haven't. I haven't yet. Uh, uh, I I watched the first it, episode the other day and it completely blew my mind. Uh, a, a bunch of my friends have watched through the whole thing, binged it, and uh, it's amazing how uh, some of those older short stories of his are still relevant today and are still uh, just as cutting edge. It's crazy. Yes, I, I agree with that. Yeah, I can't wait to watch episodes of Black Mirror left, and I need uh, to watch Electric Dreams. Yeah, so, yeah. for sure. For on, sure. On, tap, on tap. Yeah, highly recommended. Uh, so you're a Philip K. Dick fan, and uh, what, what did the idea for Tomorrow Tomorrow come from? Yeah, so Tomorrow I'd, I'd, I'd started writing stories, and... You know, and I, I was working every day, you know, in the work, and I, I was really enjoying the, the science fiction short stories I was writing. So I, I came up with the idea one one morning. Um, my wife and I had taken our honeymoon in Prague, and years later, I was yeah, <laughs> years later I was uh, looking at a walking map that we had used, and sort of like going through the, the streets just in my mind and looking at some pictures, and I, I had the thought like, oh, I wonder if this will be the, the only other time I'd ever see this city just by interacting with it through a map. And that kind of clicked on this idea. And I, I wrote a short story about a man in Prague who could only interact with his home city of Pittsburgh through a fully immersive digital interactive map, essentially a virtual reality reconstruction of a city. Um, so it was around that time that a, a novelist who I greatly admire named Stuart Onan uh, returned home to Pittsburgh. And I wrote him a fan letter and sent him that short story and he said well the only the only problem i see with this short story is that it really should be a novel so that was the first time i really wanted to try to write a real novel was on his encouragement and i made it into a like a, a crime story and the the main character is a survivor of this nuclear explosion that has obliterated a city but he can interact with the city through the arch is this digital reconstruction of it and so when he enters into the archive he uh, comes across a the scene of a murder that had been inadvertent there, and he can start then investigating the crime. Uh, but so it's a very uh, very virtual reality based uh, um, you know, story for that novel. Um, had you written a a, a lot of short stories? Was that uh, Philip K. Dick and a lot of his generation were were uh, you know that form was really popular uh, you know back then, and uh, I, a lot of a lot of writers don't go the short story route uh, anymore, but was that something that you had been working on and kind of honing that craft uh, early on? Or, or was it just, um, you know, like uh, just a as the idea comes, it, it becomes what it becomes? Yeah, I, I was writing short stories a lot back then, um, but I never had the intention to publish any of them. Um, so the idea of publishing, the, the idea of publishing is still... Thing I'm going to be doing, but it's it, it was never really part of the the daydream necessarily. So um, a lot of the short stories I would write just to work on and, and try to perfect an idea. Um, but yeah, and I and I haven't been able to work on short stories because of these novels. The, the novels really, you know, almost coming up with a short story is almost like conceiving of a novel. It just doesn't take quite as long to write. Um, 
but it takes a long time to write and, and to come up with the, you know, how everything would make sense and fit in together. So I, I do keep this a file folder of short story ideas that I'd love to, to tackle. Um, so I, yeah, I, I like that form quite a bit. Yeah, I, I do too. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Uh, I hate that there's not a, 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 a real, um, a real market anymore other than, you know, anthologies and, and things like that. And those, those are great ways for people to, uh, connect and, and, uh, uh, you know, network and things like that. But, uh, you know, some of those short stories are so powerful and, you know, pack such a punch in such a short place. And I, I still think it's a great way for writers to, uh, kind of earn their chops is, is by just cranking out their stories and learning how, you know, to, to get from point A to point B and, and have a, an emotional, you know, uh, pack, uh, pack an emotional punch for the reader. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so the, so you fleshed out the book in this novel. What's kind of the premise of, uh, Tomorrow and Tomorrow? Well, yeah. So, so, uh, so this character is, um, he's basically, uh, a freelance insurance investigator, um, who enters into the archive in order to basically dispute or support claims, um, of people that are, that have put in insurance claims. So that's how he starts out. Uh, but then he's contacted by sort of a mysterious figure who, asks him to search for traces of, of hissing daughter that someone's been deliberately deleting this person from the archive. So he starts off the search through this vanished city, um, looking for the places, um, sometimes just by go going through the, the locations that have been recorded there, sometimes by going through the code of the archive to find traces of this, uh, of this missing woman and eventually find out her, um, her story. So uh, that that book in particular, it is it is heavily influenced by like a Philip K. Dick or a John Brunner, uh, but there's a lot of Raymond Chandler in it too. Um, the main character is is uh, not quite he's not a tough guy like Marlowe, but it's definitely sort of the knight errant uh, in a corrupt world type feeling uh, with that one. Uh, Ray, Raymond Chandler, the, um, uh, the the influences there, or uh, maybe influences is, is the wrong word. The uh, kind of nod to his style uh your your books really have this great um uh sci-fi meets um thriller meets uh kind of a uh you know psychological psychological thriller uh and mystery uh do you purposely set out to mix genres up uh or are you thinking this this is the story uh, that I've come up with, and and this is kind of the window dressing that goes with it. It's going to be set in a sci-fi, maybe dystopian setting. Um, that's not what the story is. That's just some of the set pieces of the story. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah, and that's um, I, I'd say that's more accurate to how I approach them. Um, I, I definitely don't think in terms of missing genres at first. Um, I think that the way I really think of it, like from a craft perspective, so to speak, is a uh, um, if you have a if you have an idea or a vision of a sort of a future world or a science fictional concept, that in and of itself for me it isn't isn't a story. Um, so so what I've done with these first two novels is, is I've written a mystery story that takes place in inside the science fiction world or concept. Um, and so I, I almost think of the mystery plot as like an engine for the story. Um, but but yeah, I think I think a lot of it is just a uh, sort of an alchemy of influences that I have. Um, and, and I, I, the next book I'm writing, I don't know if it will if it will quite be so so mystery or procedural based. So that's not something I'm necessarily wedded to, but uh, I, I, do, I do like that it works. Yeah, uh, so I've got a team for a short story I'd uh, actually get out to all novel that story. Obviously, going probably very different than, than you originally. Uh, when you finished it, uh, what did you do with it? Yeah, when I finished it, um, I sent it back to uh, Stuart Onan, and he he liked it. He said, "I'll tell you what, I'm going to send this to my agent." And it, it, the story didn't quite end there. The agent had a lot of changes he asked if I would be willing to do or not. But so I <laughs> skip ahead to a year later of more rewrites. Um, I got into with that agent and he represented me. So um, I remember I, I sent in the book and when I got the call um, that they wanted to try to sell it, I, it, it took me, it took me a while. I, I, I had to, I had to like stop and think like, Oh, it, was I really intending for this book to be read? <laughs> read by people? Um, <laughs> And that's sort of the, the feeling I have in general about my, my, my life and my writing. But, um, yeah, so, um, but, but they did sell it. So they sold it for a, a two-book deal with uh, Putnam. And so The Gone World is number two um, uh, for, for that uh, particular contract, I guess. Nice. Um, the, the, the thought that uh, I've written this thing, and I'm not really sure if I ever intended for actual people to read it. Um, 
I absolutely love that. You know, we, uh, there's, there's writing for, for money and there, there's writing for career and, and those things are absolutely valid. And, and most of us do that or at least, you know, attach some sort of monetary importance on the, the work that we're doing and we kind of do this work. Um, but I, I think anytime you can get back to the love of storytelling, um, that's always a great thing. And I, I love that, that your books come out of that place. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's important to me. Um, yeah, thank you. So yes, <laughs> I, we, we, uh, we agree, sir. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so the, you got the two book deal and the gone world, which is, uh, is dropping early February, uh, 2018. But when, when you hear this show, uh, it will have just been released or, or will be released in a day or two. Um, uh, where did the idea of this book come from? Uh, and, and I guess a, a subsequent tack on question, when you finished the previous book, uh, what were your thoughts about writing another book? Uh, were you ready? Were, you know, was this kind of, you know, all this is just kind of out of left field. Now, how do I come up with a, with another idea? Yeah, I was, I was not ready. I was complete spent. I had just wanted to fall asleep for a long time. <laughs> Those are all true, but I had, a contract, which was brand new to me, and there was a due date on the contract, so I couldn't fall asleep. Um, yeah, so I've been thinking about um, so where it came from. A couple different places. I'd been thinking about time travel in general. I'd I'd, I'd reread a uh, hundred years of solitude uh, by Marquez, and that that has like this intergenerational sort of time memory looping effect going on. And I thought to myself, oh, it'd be cool if there was a book like that that was just a straight science fiction thriller kind of thing. So I just had in my mind. Uh, but where it all clicked into place was uh, actually before my first book even came out or I was really even finished writing it, I, I had lunch with my brother-in-law and he is a special agent with NCIS and he's a really good storyteller and he's very thoughtful and he'll answer my, my strange science fiction questions if I put them to him. And so we were having lunch and I asked him, you know, how would time travel affect uh, homicide investigation? Like how would that affect your job? And he had this really interesting answer where he said um, a lot of, a lot of murders that he investigate are, are tragic and very personal and just brutal occurrences. And a lot of people will simply tell the investigators what happened, who was involved. It's a tragedy. It's not, it's not like we're, you know, hopping in the car and chasing after the killer necessarily. But sometimes people won't talk because they're, they're too close to it. They're scared or their emotions are too high. And he posited this idea. What if you could go into the future when people's emotions have cooled down, when their relationships have changed, and what if they would tell you a little bit more? You could then bring back to the present and apply. And I thought that that's such a beautiful concept for not only time travel mechanics, but also the purpose of all, which, you know, usually looks at how characters change over in time, o over time and how characters relationships change to one another. And so I sort of tucked that away. And um, yeah, and then then later when it came time to start writing a second book, um, I had that idea and I'd been binge watching Battlestar Galactica at the time on Netflix and you know those those sort of influences came together and I told my my publisher that I think my next book would be like NCIS plus Battlestar Galactica plus time travel equals <laughs> and that was sort of the first uh the first glimpse I had for what would become uh the gone world which um you know starts from that seed and then you know changes as you write it but but yeah that's definitely the kind of the core of it the spark of the idea was it harder or more difficult uh, taking the story and pushing it out into the future? Um, does that give you more freedom as a writer to not uh, be so married to current technology or near current technology? Um, does, does it really kind of open up the possibilities? Uh, to agree. Like, when, uh, like when, you're, when you're dealing with time travel, like time travel as we know it now is not possible. Um, so when you start writing about it, it it's just kind of magic. Um, does that become easier do, do you feel the need to uh wrap it up in some sort of real technology um like what, how do you approach that yeah i i felt like i really wanted it to read like a plausible scientific solution for time travel so i did i did some research on that and i say plausible not accurate um I, that's how i approach science fiction technology in general um but uh but the other thing is with the gone world they have access to very far futures and they study the technology of those futures and then bring it back to their present, which takes place through the 80s and the early mid 90s. And they try to apply that that future technology to the industrial capabilities they have of that era. So 
um, even within the world of the book, there's they feel limitations of what they're actually able to do with time travel. Gotcha. Um, what is the what is the mystery uh, in this book? Well, the the, the crime mystery um, starts out. So the main character is an NCIS special agent, Shannon Moss, and she is part of a basically a top secret division within NCIS that investigates crimes relating to the deep waters program of the Naval Space Command, which is they have access to both deep space and deep time. So the book starts off when she's called to a crime scene in rural western Pennsylvania. Uh, a family's been killed, and their prime suspect, an, a Navy SEAL, um, was one of these sailors and by all accounts, he shouldn't even exist in the real world anymore. And so the questions become, how is he here? Why did he do this crime? What happened to his ship? And uh, from there, it, it branches out into the discovery of an end of the world scenario called the Terminus that is sort of growing steadily closer to the present. And as the, the two large mysteries begin to intertwine, Shannon finds herself at the center of both. Yeah, one uh, uh, one thing that's, that's difficult to write uh, about time travel, especially when you have someone going into the, the future um, uh, or to the past for that matter, is having your characters, uh, uh, what constraints you put on them on how they can interact with the world. Uh, are they going to change what happens? Or if they discover something about their future, does that uh, change what they think about the present? Does that alter how they're going to act from there. Um, as a writer, how do you start wrestling with those ideas and what kind of constraints do you put on your characters to, uh, because you talked about uh, plausible, but maybe not necessarily doable, uh, but how do you set up those parameters for your characters to live within? So all the questions you just mentioned um, tie into the plot for the Gone World. They're, they're, those, those kinds of constraints and challenges are sort of... Uh, Count, you know, counted for. Uh, and, um, the, um, so what happens is that Shannon is able to time travel into not the future, but possible futures. So um, when, when she goes ahead in time, the first time, um, she can meet certain characters, uh, learn some, certain information, all based off of what more or less probably might happen based on the conditions of the present. And she comes back to the present. If she were to go to the future a second time, things might change. Um, they might be different depending on what she's been doing in the present or just, just the natural way the odds fall. Um, so, so in the book, she does time travel twice. And one of the things that happens is that um, and by the second time she goes, all sorts of ramifications from the action that's come before in the novel. And uh, it sort of feeds into, um, and the first time she goes to the future feeds emotionally and plot wise into how she experiences the present. Um, the other thing that happens is that when Shannon travels, you can go to the future and live there, say, for 10 years, and you come back to the present like you've never left at all. So things that she's constantly dealing with is how she ages relative to the other people in her life, and not only the physical strain, but also the how she simply appears. And uh, so that's something that's, uh, you know, keeps coming up for her also is just something internally that she, she works with. Um, you, um, uh, did, did you do any research for, for the science fiction aspects of this? You've got astronauts, you've got, I know you've got an NCIS agent that you, uh, bounce ideas off of there for the procedural type stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you go about researching, um, you know, believable astronauts and, and things like that? Yeah, so for the for the science part, um, my father in law was a um, theoretical physicist for the Department of Defense. Uh, he was an early pioneer of quantum computing and worked on quantum cryptography for for decades. And uh, so, as I've been married to my wife, um, I would talk with him too about science concepts um, quite a bit and about time travel and things like that. And he's very, he's very serious minded person, but he, he, he did like the opportunity to sort of like connect with me on, on, on those topics. So we did have a lot of great conversations. Um, unfortunately he passed away, um, before he could, he could read this book, but a lot of the science is rooted in, in my conversations with him. And then, so, but after I, I wrote the book, I got in touch with a physics professor at Carnegie Mellon 
and um, asked if he would be willing to read through. It was about 10 pages worth of, of scientific explanations just to make sure that, um, you know, think, things felt plausible and real enough. And, and he did. And he gave me a, a few tweaks and changes. But um, um, but, yeah, once I once I showed it to him, I felt fairly confident that uh, the book would hold together on a science basis. I'm sorry to hear about your father-in-law, but uh, what an amazing touch point you have to remember those conversations you had with him and when holding this book. That's got to be a great feeling. It is, yeah. I, I miss him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah. Um, you, you've got some uh, exciting news about the Gone World to hear uh, recently. To what's going on with, uh, with the uh, – I, I think you got some film news. Yeah. Well, the film news is – has been very exciting for uh, for me. The um, so Fox um, bought the option to the book pretty early on, and right after they purchased the option, Neil Blomkamp read read the book and really responded very passionately to it and signed on to adapt and direct it. Um, so that happened. It was, it was a little while ago now, a little over a year ago. But um, once I got in touch with me, and we you know, started correspondence and a friendship and, and hit off. And, and uh, so, yeah, I, I, I really can't wait. The movie happens. Like, we see what he does with it. I'm, I'm a huge fan of his films. Uh, and, yeah. District has, 9. District 9. Uh, yeah. It has been very exciting. And then and then the two of us worked together. Um, he started a studio called Oats Studios, which has uh, all sorts of ideas. But the, the centerpieces of his of the first round of his new studio are three uh, short science fiction films that we co-wrote together. And uh, that came about after he had he had read my book. So that was uh, that's what I've been working on with him for summer, like co- co-writing these trips. And that was this is incredible adventure for me. It's it was really, very, very fun. How cool. Um, how mind blowing is it to have a studio option your film uh, and a, a great, uh, you know, filmmaker uh, get attached to it before the book even comes out? Yeah, it's um, it's it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> my mind is blown. Um, yeah, it's a. Uh, it's very fun. I mean, I think specifically, I mean, I, out of, you know, a lot of the gone world and the character can be complicated very complex and the, a lot of the writing is about the, the emotional states of the main character. Um, but scene to scene, I spend a lot of time trying to write them very cinematically. I think about films quite a bit. So, so knowing that the manuscript has gone off and that real news and directors have responded that way to it is very, very satisfying to me in terms of that sort of cinematic visual quality of the book. Um, Tom uh, Sweaterlich, the the new book is called The World. We're going to send everybody to go pick up a copy of it. Um, Tom, you are a storyteller, storyteller, and uh, I'm I'm super glad that you time to come on the show today. Where can people find you if they want to follow along with all the great stuff that's going on? Uh, well, thanks, thank you again for having me. Again, I'm a big fan of your show, so this has been very cool. Um, probably the best place is on Twitter. I'm, I'm not a huge social media or online person, but I will occasionally do Twitter, so that's the that's the best place. It's at Letter Switch. Um, just sort of a spoonerism on my last name there. And um, yeah, that's probably the best way to find me. Essence, book one, Septima, the first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Troy is no longer himself. Kidnapped by aliens infected with the essence of the dead General Tomas, Troy grasps at his only hope of survival. He merges his soul with the alien parasite trying to possess him, leaving him forever changed, and not entirely for the worse. Once plagued by crippling phobias, Troy is now fearless, willing to fight his enemies with his bare hands. But with his new strength also comes a new weakness, women. Tomas was notorious for his insatiable desires, and Troy finds himself constantly resisting temptation, especially the gorgeous, manipulative Alta. Although Alta has convinced the Pyrrhans she's helping them prepare to battle the murderous Reptarans, she's actually meticulously planning to steal their ultimate power source and then abandon them to their fate. Alta won't hesitate to kill anyone in her way, and her deep love for Tomas is Troy's only advantage. He convinces Alta that Tomas has taken full control of his being and thus keeps her trust and his life. While Alta schemes, Troy covertly struggles to save the Pyrrhans and prevent the Reptorans from invading Earth. But first, he must wrest back control of his own soul. Essence, Book One, Septima, the first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Find it on Amazon today. There's a link in the show notes. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. 
For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Summer waned. The sun still kissed the waters of the Hudson, but less passionately, like a bride having second thoughts. The days grew a minute shorter, the shadows a millimeter longer, and fear descended upon Sleepy Hollow just as imperceptibly. Even in the heat of July, when the town still wore shorts and sandals, when it still carried ice chests and pressed beers to its forehead, when its children played in sand piles and its old men sat talking baseball. Bad things began to happen. Everywhere, it seemed. On the afternoon of July 10th, two Terrytown women went shopping at the barn's stationery store. Both reached for the last package of lace wedding invitations at the same time. Their confrontation ended with bloody fists and an ambulance ride. On July 14th, Larry Putnam choked on a California spring roll at Andy Ng's Japanese sushi restaurant on Beekman Avenue. The following Saturday, Judy Jessup found Gypsy, her daughter's black cat, dead, strung up on the fence behind their house, just dangling there, eyes open and fangs bared. Come sunset, fireflies hung thick above the lawns of the hollow. Red eyes peered through the shutters of abandoned houses. A mist rose from the parched earth and hung low, especially behind the old Dutch church, among the graves of the ancient burying ground. The old Croton Aqueduct Trail, usually a summer playground, grew eerily empty. Hardly anyone walked there, especially at night, when gnarled branches held hands and rustled to each other around cauldron clearings of moonlight. Those who did so reported strange attacks, gossamer apparitions, and the distant sound of horses' hooves. Eleven years prior, after the GM plant had closed, when the village of North Terrytown had been rechristened Sleepy Hollow, it had seemed natural to adopt the horseman as town mascot. He appeared on the badges of the police officers, on the sides of the fire trucks, on the menus of restaurants, on the stationery of the mayor. He arose from his grave as a tchotchke in the gift shops. He haunted the helmets of the football team, the windows of the bike shop, the rings presented to outgoing seniors. The black-cloaked figure of the headless horseman manifested everywhere, ubiquitous as Mickey Mouse in the Magic Kingdom, and almost as subliminal. People had grown used to the horseman, fond of him even. Eventually they had ceased to notice him. They noticed him now. And they noticed him everywhere. On hats and collar pins and park signs, on cars and buses, on statues, on plaques, on the side of the chevron. The horseman galloped down Beekman Avenue, shop window by shop window. He rode in daylight and in darkness and in the nightmares of their children. Their fondness for the figure became fear, dread, and doubt. Why had they named their town after a ghost story? To name a thing is to give it power, to give it substance and flesh. What had they done? Each sunset, as the village of Sleepy Hollow sank deeper into shadow, more and more former North Terrytowners wondered if embracing the legend hadn't been a mistake. But they had to press forward. The mill wheel turns. Summer ends. Time comes for school to start. The ball glove goes into the closet. Grandfather asks for a jacket. Beer becomes coffee or pumpkin spice. A leaf turns, falls, and twists. The season comes. There's money to be made. Time to unpack the fright masks, to fetch the scarecrow from his firehouse closet. Time to bundle the corn stalks and light the pumpkins. Time for the headless horseman to menace the tourists again.